We're in Hebrews in chapter 13, and I uh, told you Sunday that uh, I preached a message on brotherly love and what it was and, and where it originated and how to get it. Uh, we're going to be continuing in Hebrews in chapter 13 tonight. Let me remind you that uh, the writer of Hebrews most think it was Paul's addressing Jewish, primarily a Jewish congregation or a, a group, uh, perhaps in the Hebrew church, uh, that had come out of Judaism uh, through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ because of their faith in Him, and they'd entered into the New Testament the church. Uh, it appears, from, as you read through Hebrews, it appears that there were several things that they wanted to bring out of Judaism into Christianity. And I mentioned Sunday when the writer, is, as our Bibles are, are translated today, uh, when he, he penned these words in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 1, he assumed that that was something that they had already possessed because of their relationship to one another in Christ. And he, uh, if there was a schism within the church, because of uh, sacrificial meats that had been eaten or because of certain Sabbaths or, or festivals that, had, that uh, either had or had not been celebrated, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, is encouraging them, let brotherly love, let it abide, let it continue, let it overcome, let it lead, and let it guide. And uh, then he begins, he begins to lay out for this group of Hebrew believers just some, some very basic principles of Christian living. John MacArthur said this in regards to the last chapter of Hebrews. He said the last chapter of the epistle focuses on some of the essential practical ethics of Christian living. These ethics help portray the true gospel to the world, encourage others to believe in Christ, and bring glory to God. The whole purpose behind the church is to glorify the Lord. The whole purpose behind your salvation is to bring you into fellowship with God for the glory of Him. So, if we continue to let brotherly love continue, or if we keep on letting brotherly love continue, that applies to each and every believer that we come into contact with. That should be... It should take place not only by words, but also by actions. As he begins to unfold in the 13th chapter, he, it applies not only to those of the local church, but perhaps those brothers or sisters in Christ who have come together. He says in verse 2, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Most scholars agree that this was probably, probably referring back to both Abraham and Lot's experience. If you remember with Abraham, there were three characters that came before Abraham while he was out on the plains and spoke to him. Two of them being angels, one of them being the very Son of God Himself. And so as the writer of Hebrews is writing, he's saying, let brotherly love continue and don't forget, don't forget to accept those who come in the name of Christ. Now, as we look at this, and you know, it's very important for us to understand the difference, the differences as to what the Hebrew writer is saying to the Hebrew church. He is not saying to go out and to entertain anyone and everyone who comes in. He's not saying to go out and to, to uh, if you will, uh, just be acceptance or acceptable to anyone who says, well, you know what, I'm a Christian. As a matter of fact, if you look back at the early writings of the church, there was a, there was a, a writing uh, called the Didache. It ultimately was an early church ministry manual. Now, we in the Baptist church, we've probably all heard of the Hobbes, uh, the, Hob the Baptist church manual written by Hobbes. But this, was a, this was, goes all the way back to the early church. Many believe that this was perhaps because it came out of the Nicene Council that it was referencing the Catholic Church before the Reformation period. But it was very common in these days because very few ends existed for people to accept strangers into their homes. 
the Daibeshi, it, uh, it kind of proposed guidelines for those who, of whom you were to accept. In other words, let me read an excerpt uh, from the Antinocene Fathers. It says, in volume 7 of page 380, it says, Let every apostle that comes to you be received as the Lord, but he shall not remain except one day. But if there be need, also the next. But if he remains three days, he is a false prophet. And when the apostles go away, let him take nothing but bread. But if he asks for money, he is a false prophet. And every prophet that speaks in the Spirit, you shall neither try nor judge, for every sin shall be forgiven, but this one sin shall not be forgiven. But not everyone that speaks in the Spirit is a prophet, but only if he holds the ways of the Lord. Therefore, from their way shall a false prophet and the true prophet be known. Ultimately, what he's saying is, or what this is saying, is that you look at people's fruit and you judge them by their fruit, whether or not they're a Christian or not, and to the point to which you are to exhibit or to display Christian hospitality to them. For instance, you couldn't go downtown uh, Fort Smith or you couldn't go to some, uh, just any old institution or business along the way and go up to a perfect stranger and say, hey, why don't you come home with me tonight? Now, first of all, that's going to present, uh, that's going to be, present itself as a provocative question. Or you couldn't say to just anybody, well, why don't you stay at my house tonight? Because, first of all, you don't have the, the first and foremost priority in your life with that individual if they're not a Christian. Therefore, everything else is, elim is eliminated in, res in respect to Christian hospitality. You know and I know that we oftentimes have people to come by the church and they're seeking a handout. They're looking for, uh, they're asking for gas money or they're asking for bus ticket money or they're asking for uh, money for uh, medicine or they're asking. Years ago, I don't do it so much anymore, years ago when I was pastoring down in southwest Arkansas, when someone would come by the church and they would ask for bills to be paid, it was either utilities or rent in that area, and we have even had some of, that, some of that here. I would ask them, well, what can you do? And most of the time they would kind of look at me with a puzzled look on their face, and I, and I would simply look at them and tell them, I'm going to give you the opportunity to earn your utility bill. Or I'm going to give you the opportunity to earn your water bill or, or your rent. Now, it's, it's, it shouldn't surprise you, but I had very few takers. You could genuinely tell those who were in dire straits and desperate need. Because they would be more than willing... They would be more than willing to do whatever I asked them to do, whether it was sweeping off the sidewalk or, or uh, weed eating around the church or the city park. I took a guy down to the city park one day and I told him, I said, the city needs uh, this ditch we needed from this end all the way to that end. I said, because we have kids out here playing. Now granted, I gave him my weed ear and, and used my gas to, to weed eat, but he was more than glad to do that. However, if he were to come to me and say, well, you know what, I need a place to stay tonight. Can I stay at your house? I would have said absolutely not. Because in our conversation, I talked to him about his relationship with the Lord. Now the irony of it is, is that the guy that I took down to the city uh, park to weed eat the ditch from one end to the other, about a month later he was arrested for killing his wife. True story. True story. But what the writer is telling the Hebrew Christians is, is if a brother or sister is in dire straits or in need, you do the best that you can to provide for that, for that need at the moment. But don't allow even them to take advantage of it. And if they do take advantage of it, then they're not sent from God. They're not of God. And obviously, 
uh, as the Dianeshi refers to, they're not a prophet. And perhaps they were speaking in reference to visiting prophets or clergy that went from town to town ministering from place to place to different groups of people. However, as the church, it is our biblical obligation to take care of the fellowship of Christ. It's our biblical obligation to take care of the fellowship of the body of Christ. He goes on in verse 3, says, Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Now to me, as I look at this passage and take it in the context in which it's written, obviously it's speaking of those who've been arrested or persecuted or imprisoned for their faith. Some have, have taken this particular passage and have expounded upon it, expanded upon it, to mean that we should go and we should entertain jail ministries and prison ministries. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't. Uh, even, even our con convention, our state convention, as well as our Southern Baptist convention are very active in, in prison ministries and jail ministries. And we support those actions and those ministries to those individuals that they might hear the gospel. But in the context of Scripture, the writer is saying, listen, you need to, you need to empathize, you need to sympathize for those who've been arrested, persecuted for their faith. He goes on to say in verse 4, or, or <clears throat> in verse 4, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. God highly esteems marriage. Many have have gone through the scriptures and they've interpreted certain passages to mean that celibacy was preferred over marriage. However, we know that the first marriage God instituted there in the Garden of Eden and God highly esteems the marriage vows. But in the same way that He highly esteems the marriage vows and honors marriage, He has a special divine judgment for those who practice sexual intimacy outside of marriage. For those fornicators. For those adulterers. He says, let your, verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say in verse 6, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Let your conversation, as the King James translates it, some translations might say, let your life or your living. Let the way that you live show the practice of contentment in your heart. Why is it for a Christian that we should learn to be content with what we have? I mean, if you think about it today, I like what one writer said. He said, often covetousness and greed are excused or even admired in today's culture and simply called ambition. David Guzak says in his commentary, contentment has much more to do with what you are on the inside rather than what you have. The Apostle Paul had the right idea in Philippians where he writes this in chapter 4 and verses 11 through 13. He says, Not that I speak in regard to want. For I have learned that in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know both how, how to abound. And everywhere in all things I've learned to be both full and to be hungry.
both to abound and to suffer need. And we all know what Philippians 4.13 says. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see the sustenance and the substance of the Christian is having the peace of God in our hearts so that we don't exhibit covetousness. So that we don't practice greed or seek after those things where the thief breaks in and steals. Or moth and rust cause it to decay. I'm not saying that there's not anything wrong with having things. But when we allow having things to be the priority over whom we have or who has us, then we've passed from the peace that passes all understanding to the ambition that the world upholds and cheers. You remember the promise of God in the last part of verse 5. This comes from Deuteronomy. Ultimately, it's the foundation for contentment. When God says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God will never leave you. He'll never let you down. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And then he, the writer transitions. You see how he's laying out the foundational principles for, for everyday Christian living. Our, our response uh, to the brotherhood. Our response to the brotherhood who's in prison. Our response to our spouse and our marriage. Uh, our, our physical sexual desires. Our livelihood. He goes on to talk concerning the leadership. He says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. One translator, or one commentator puts it this way, that this verse in the Greek would rather be interpreted, Remember those which have had the rule over you. Because these are those faithful, those faithful, godly men and women who have instigated in you as Paul did young Timothy to stir up that gift which was is within you as he told Timothy it's those biblical leaders who have spurred you on to down the Christian path encouraged you in the Christian race to reach that heavenly goal He's saying, remember them, as the King James Version puts it. Ultimately, we could translate that word, remember, into another word, another English word, to recognize. To recognize. Each and every believer has a responsibility to recognize and follow godly leadership. Another, tr another translation could be this way. Remember your guides, your teachers, your leaders. Adam Clark says, who have spoken unto you the doctrine of God. Paul advised Timothy along the same lines. He said, 
in 1 Timothy in chapter 4 and verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in so doing this, you will save both yourself and those that hear you. That's not the King James translation. But he goes on to say, whose faith, last part of verse 7, follow considering the end of their conversation. Considering the end of their conversation, how they lived out their faith. You know, we've had, I know in particular myself, I've had many godly examples who have died and gone to be with the Lord for whom, I, for whom I am grateful that I may follow in their footsteps because they led by example even to the day of their death they led by example In verse 8 it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The writer speaks of the unchanging nature. Or some theologians put it, the immutability of Jesus. Because of his deity, because of who he was. God doesn't change over the ages and because Jesus is God, Jesus never changes. And so he can say, I will never leave you nor forsake you. John Gill says, who is the substance of the word spoken by the above mentioned rulers, the author and object of their faith and the end in which their conversation is terminated. In verse 9, he begins to warn, just as he's given instructions for godly and Christian living in verses 1 through 8. In verse 9, he, he begins to warn them concerning strange doctrines, strange teachings. Some have alluded to the fact that this was, this was a caution for them not to err and to go back and to, to accept Judaism and its ritualism with all of its festivals and sacrifices and intermingle it with Christianity. Obviously, we've had that issue all throughout the book of Hebrew. Perhaps there were those we don't know of any by name in this particular chapter or in this particular book. But we do know the Apostle Paul wrote of some and named them by name who'd begun to introduce false doctrines within the church. Sadly, Sadly, many people probably had followed. Many people had probably accepted that doctrine. He says in verse 9, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which served the tabernacle for, <coughs> excuse me, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. This passage refers back, if you remember, Back under the Levitical law, as sacrifices were brought to the temple to be sacrificed to the Lord, <clears throat> oftentimes the priests were allowed to eat what was left over. That was their supply, their portion. Ex with one exception. On the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, the sacrifice, the sacrificial blood was brought to the temple for the priest to use to sprinkle over the altar for the sins of the people. But the carcasses of the animals were taken outside of the tabernacle and they were commanded to be burnt, destroyed. 
In the same way, in the same way, Jesus shed his blood outside of the tabernacle, outside of the temple. The temple veil was rent from top to bottom, but Jesus died outside the tabernacle. His blood was shed outside the tabernacle. You and I, you and I are living in grace. And the writer is saying, listen, as Christians, to the Hebrews, as Christians, let us accept the sacrifice of Jesus because we've been saved by grace for which your Judaistic brothers have no part or of which they have no part. Don't waver to and fro with every wind of doctrine that blows through. Don't allow yourself to be influenced by someone who has no part in God's kingdom. So let us go forth. Therefore unto Him. Some commentaries say that literally our sacrifice is at the cross. At the cross. At the cross. Where I first saw the light. John MacArthur says, those who are experiencing God's grace in Christ have hearts and minds that remain stable. One commentary says that in regards to these folks, their friends and relatives remaining in traditional Judaism labeled these Jewish Christians illegitimate because they did not continue in the Levitical system but the writer of Hebrews insisted that we have an altar and it is an altar that those who cling to the Levitical system have no right to. Essentially, our altar is the cross. Our sacrifice is at the cross. Our sin is left at the cross. He says in verse 14, For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Here we have no city, but we seek one to come. Can anybody tell me the name of that city? We see it mentioned in the book of Revelation as the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. It's the city where God's throne is and where God reigns. It's the city of which we belong because we don't belong here on this earth. It's the city where the Lamb's Book of Life is. The place in which each and every believer's name is written down. It's the city of righteousness. He goes on to say in verse 15, By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. But to do good, in verse 16, and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. He begins to speak concerning Worship, the, the reason we, we can worship our Lord and our Savior, the, the way that we can sacrifice because we have an altar, the cross, and we have a high priest who is Jesus, and we should always offer up sacrifices. 
The sacrifice that we offer up is the fruit of our lips and the good that we do to others. And I want you to notice those two are tied together. Because, let me tell you, praise that pleases God is offered by Him, that is by Jesus Christ, on the ground of His righteousness, and it's pleasing to God. Praise that pleases God is offered continually so that we are always praising Him. Praise that pleases God is sacrificial praise. One writer puts in that it may be costly or inconvenient. Praise that pleases God is the fruit of our lips more than just the thoughts directed towards God. It is spoken out unto the Lord either in prose or in song. Guthrie writes this in his commentary. He says, What proceeds from the lips is regarded as fruit, which reveals the character of its source as the fruit of a tree reveals the nature of the tree. McLaren says that loving hearts must speak. That loving hearts must speak. But just as we praise God with our lips, we also praise God when we do good to others. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. We also please God when we, when we do good and we share. And the greatest thing that we have to share, and the greatest good that we can do is to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom because that is well pleasing to God. As we begin to close out the chapter, and I don't know if I'm going to have time, I was going to let y'all out a little early. <coughs> Anybody getting sleepy? <laughs> you got just a few more minutes? In the last part of the chapter, in his closing words, he begins to speak about obedience to those that rule over you. And he says, <coughs> Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, I want to stop right there for just a minute. Many have taken this passage and as... Uh, Several years ago, there was a movement that came through the church, and it's still somewhat going through some churches today. It's called the shepherding movement. The shepherding movement. In the shepherding movement, the elders of the pastor were the sole authority of the church. You simply obeyed them or you pledged allegiance to them. Now, true. The scripture says, and this is in regards to pastors and elders. And I just so I don't get the big head, let me finish, okay? The scripture says to obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves. The shepherding movement promoted a blind obedience or a blind allegiance. David Jeremiah said that, says this in regards to this passage. He says, The key to harmony and prosperity in the church is good leaders and good followers. But believers are not called to blind obedience either. Church elders or pastors must gently and effectively watch out for the souls in their congregation, knowing that one day they will give an account for their leadership. Another guy by the name of Chuck Smith said this. He said, sadly, some take the idea of submission of leaders in the church too far. The shepherding movement was a clear example of this kind of abuse. 
But he goes on to say that a teacher, this is Chuck's now, a teacher should teach us to submit to God, not to himself. David Guzik said in his commentary, we must, we obey and submit to our leaders because God put them in a place of responsibility and accountability over us. This does not relieve individual responsibility, but it puts an additional accountability and responsibility upon leaders. In Baptist churches, In Baptist churches, obedience, and, and I'm, like I said, I'm not going to get to be here. In Baptist churches, there's pastoral authority and bodily unity go hand in hand. That's why in Baptist churches, or in most Baptist churches, let me put it that way, we're democratically run. Granted, the pastor has certain responsibilities as he is the under-shepherd of the church. And there is a certain amount of respect and obedience that should be allowed to the pastor if he's a godly man. But the church must pay attention. In seeking a pastor to lead the church, the church must be certain of the men that they allow to follow or the men that they choose to follow the men that they choose to follow that's why and in Baptist churches this is not done enough I know some instances uh, within the past 10 years where churches have been greatly disrupted and divided over the selection of the wrong pastor or the wrong man as their pastor. On the other hand, pastors must be careful that they don't overstep the boundaries of pastoral authority. Do you know what the pastor's responsibility is in regards to you? Your spiritual well-being. Your spiritual well-being. It's not to lord it over you. It's not to whip you down the path, but to be the shepherd and to guide you. Men who would be pastors must understand the accountability for which they will be held to God and the responsibility that they have to the spiritual nourishment of the church according to the Word of God. That's why it tells us and we often look at the, the qualifications for deacons and pastors in light of each other because they're very, very similar. That's why it tells us not to lay hands on a man too quickly. Too quickly. The writer of Hebrews goes on to close out. He says, pray for us, for we trust, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly, but I beseech you the rather to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace, he begins to pronounce a blessing. He asks for their prayers. He begins to pronounce a blessing. He says, now the God of peace that brought again the dead uh, from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that the, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So we see a request for prayer. We see a blessing pronounced. Uh, Charles Adams Spurgeon says in regards to the blessing, he said the apostle had exhorted the Hebrew believers to pray for him in the words, pray for us, and then 
as if to show that he did not ask of them what he was not himself willing to give he utters this most powerful or most wonderful prayer for them he may confidently say to his congregation pray for me who does uh, unfeignedly or unfeignedly from his soul pray for them and in his blessing we find that God first of all is recognized in his attributes the God of peace the God of power the one who raised the Lord from the dead the God of loving care that great shepherd who willingly gets his life to the sheep who leaves the 99 and seeks that one the one of ever giving love because it's the blood of the everlasting covenant. He closes, he says, I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written the letter unto you in few words. Know you that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom if he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute all them that have rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. One of the things that leads us to believe that the book of Hebrews was written by the Apostle Paul is more particularly the closing. Some Bible scholars, as they read through Hebrews, they note little inserts in there that are Pauline in their likeness. But other discrepancies that say, well, you know, Paul didn't necessarily write after that manner. But as we look to the close of the book of Hebrews, we know that Paul was imprisoned in Rome, correct? This letter to the church, or to the Hebrew Christians, was, let, was written in Italy. He says that they of Italy salute you. It's a little picture that opens up into a large screen that allows us to see that there are not only Christians here, but there are Christians spread across a broad region at the time and they, as a part of the body of Christ, are greeting each other, they're praying for each other, they're encouraging each other, they're exhorting one another, they're caring for one another. As a Christian, that's what we're called to do. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. We finished up the, the book of Hebrews. And look at there, we got one minute until late. Remember time. Anybody got any closing comments or announcements, anything? We will have a regular worship service 10.30 Sunday morning, again, as we did this last Sunday, okay? Uh, Don and I are gonna work tomorrow. We need to work on the FM transmitter. We had a little trouble last week, and I think I know what the problem was on that, Don, so uh, I think I, I, thought, I thought of something it may be. Let me put it that way. Uh, but we'll have the FM transmitter set up. If you don't want to come in, you can stay in your cars out uh, out in the parking area. A possible chance of rain Sunday, so be sure maybe the windows roll up if you sit in your car. All right, let's stand together. We'll be dismissed in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity to study your word. Lord, for the encouragement that we receive to, uh, Lord, continue in your grace to live our life according to your example, to care for one another, Lord, to, to be cautious of the doctrine of grace and the salvation that comes through faith. 
Lord, we pray for these that are, have been mentioned tonight on this prayer list. We pray that the families of the lost loved ones would feel your touch. That those who are sick would experience your healing. But Lord, we pray also for the lost. They would hear your word. Let us be found faithful in your sight and pleasing in your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.